morning, everybody. I will thank the organizer and the scientific committee for inviting me. I am very honored to be here today with an ambitious mission to explore with you the deep sea and to discover a part of abyssal life, a microscopic world populated by tiny animals, the Mayo fauna. And I, I have to admit that this is not an easy task. So uh, I will try to use uh, a children's story as a metaphoric mirror of our dive. Sorry, one second. OK. Uh, so it's Alice in Wonderland. Do you remember when Alice followed the white rabbit in the rabbit hole? And uh, she found herself falling down in a very deep well. Will we do the same? Will we try to follow our white rabbit, our passion, our curiosity about the deep sea? And we will dive, we will embark in the no-till, and we will start our dive into, depth, into the depth of the oceans. It will be cold, dark, depression will increase. Don't be afraid, you have just entered the deep sea. With an average depth of four kilometers, the deep ocean covers 66% of the Earth's surface. The largest habitat on our planet is the less suitable for life, at least for life as we know it. Low temperature, an average of four degrees Celsius below 1,000 meter water depth, high pressure, we have one atmosphere every 10 meter depth, and one atmosphere equal to one kilogram force per square centimeter. No light, this means no photosynthesis, so limited food resources for, for, band, for deep sea animals. For all this reason, the deep sea was considered for a long time a great desert of life. It was only in 1977 that the first oases of abyssal life were discovered around submarine volcanoes. A colleagues exploring the Galapagos Rift discovered very strange temperature anomalies, moving from almost zero to 400 degrees they made a fascinating discovery, the deep sea hydrothermal vents. And they also found a unique ecosystem, high abundance, high biomass, hundreds of new species, giant animals, giant bivalve, giant worms. Uh, so. Try to move to the next one, okay. This is possible thanks to the chemosynthesis an alternative way to photosynthesis. This revolutionary discovery has shown how microorganisms can use toxic elements of the vent fluid in energy form available for the other vent organisms. But outside of these oases of life, what we can find in the deep sea? We can just have a look. Rocks, sediment, sand, rocks, sediment, rock. Sediment, sand, sediment, sand, sediment. It's not so exciting, isn't it? But it's not a desert, as we can think. A lot of very small organisms, microorganisms, uh, organisms of meiofauna, swarm in abyssal sediment. These environments are very poor because they depend from the food from the surface. So now I still need Alice. To, to show you the Mayo fauna. So when Alice drink, drank uh, the, from the little bottle and she found herself shrinking down, will we do the same? We have to shrink down ten, between 1,000 and 10,000 times our size. May, we can compare a Mayo fauna organisms to a man, like a man to a to the height where only rockets fly. We are not in the infinitely small of 
microorganism, but we have the sites of animal that we can observe at the stereo microscope. We call meiofauna all the animals less than millimeter that live in marine sediment. These little organisms are everywhere around us, but they are often neglected by their very little sites. We have, in, in our world, we have 35 phyla of, anima, of animals, and 24 that can be observed in meiofauna. This means that almost all marine animals spend their life, or part of their life, when they are very little, when they are juvenile, when they are larvae, in these small sites. But let me show you some myofauna guides. For example, the lorichifera or the tardigrades and the nematodes, a group of microscopic worms. They are very abundant and they dominate the myofauna. Just an example, if tomorrow we will go to the beach and we decide to do an castle, uh, a, a sand castle, we will sample something like 5,000 nematodes 70 copepods, small crustaceans, and a dozen of little animals for each little bucket of sand. So now you are, you are smaller than a grain of sand and you discover the deep sea, so you are in the deep sea Mayufona wonderland. But let's go back to the deep sea. I, I have to admit that there are, that was made a big effort in the last year to try to show how amazing the deep sea are, how amazing the deep sea cre creatures you can find, the amazing landscape that you, you can observe, sea mount, coral reef, hydrothermal vents. There were made a lot of books, photos, films. For example, if you go to, to Google, on Google Books and you look for Deep Sea, you can find more than 600,000 books. And there were made also a lot of movies, the documentaries, for example, uh, the Deep Sea Challenge of uh, James Cameron that explored the Mariana Trench. And you can also find a lot of didactical educational support, such as the third lesson of Lydia Lins. But what do we still have to discover in the Deep Sea? The deep sea are mostly uncharted. Only 5% of the deep sea floor has been explored by remote instrument. And of this 5%, less than 1% is as well, well studied. A practical example, you take a soccer field and you take a tennis table ball. The soccer field is deep sea and the tennis table ball is what we know about it. We still have a lot to do, isn't it? What about the diversity? I want to show you a case, a case study. I was involved a few years ago in a project uh, working uh, on Condor Seamount. This seamount is, uh, is near the Azore Islands, and we studied the diversity of this very peculiar ecosystem. It, only looking, just looking at four little color of these sites, we discovered, and only look at two nematode family, we discovered two new genera and more than 10 new species. So we work together, three generation of taxonomies, myself, Anne Valorosel, and Wilfrida de Kramer, and we try to describe this amazing heterodiversity. And this was the same for all the myofonal group, such as the tardigrades. Current estimates suggest that we have something like between 10 and 30 million of new species to describe. And if, if, it, if we use the time necessary for classical taxonomical description, we can calculate uh, 10,000 years the time necessary to describe the majority of existing species. Just to remember you, 10,000 years ago, we were in the Mesolithic age during the Quaternary extinction event. So maybe we have to find new way to describe diversity. We start to have new tools. For example, the environmental DNA metabarcoding. In very few simple words, we take a spoon of sediment and we extract all the, all the genetic information of all the organisms. We don't look at animals at all. We, we only look at uh, DNA to try to understand who is where 
who does what. These te techniques are still at their infancy for the deep sea. A preliminary study suggests that nematodes are almost half of things you can find in deep sea sediment. It's quite good for me. But I, I really want to highlight the, the problematic of this technique that there are still, uh, we, we cannot use this technique in a bland way. We really have to test and to be sure that, that they represent the, ra the real diversity. So we launched the project at Ifremer, the Pourquoi Pas les Abyss project, that aims to test the technique and to try to reveal the eater diversity in the deep sea. What do we still have to discover in the deep sea? I tried to put some points, like the connectivity between the deep sea ecosystem, the life cycle, reproduction, dispersal capability of deep sea animal, the effect of deep sea events, such as uh, deep sea storms or landslide, the temporal variation, uh, the impact of season, of tide in the deep sea, the colonization processes. Several deep sea ecosystems are ephemeral, so how animals can colonize this kind of environment, resilience, feeding strategy, interaction between the prokaryotes, sorry, prokaryotes, meiofauna, macrofauna, metabolism, bioturbation. But I mean, this is just a few examples. We still have a lot to do. So now we know that there's a big potential uh, in the study of deep sea. We have a lot of things to do. But why is the deep sea important for us, human? But we are aware of the importance of the ocean for, uh, for human as supporting services, primary production, nutrient cycling, provision services, fishing, oil, gas, uh, biotechnology, regulating services, gas and climate regulation, carbon sequestration and storage, and cultural service, education, aesthetical, spiritual values. And the drugs produced by marine invertebrates, algae, and bacteria is one of the promising biotechnology activity. For example, uh, two compounds extracted from sponges, one that uh, is active anti -ca uh, against cancer, another active against herpes virus, or a neurotoxin extracted from um, a snail that has a painkiller effect 10,000 times powerful than morphine. And our little nematodes can be potentially a very good candidate for the production of drug. Why? Because nematodes and uh, bacteria, they, 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 all, they, they cohabit together. And despite their simplicity, uh, despite the simplicity of nematodes, they have no brain, no circulatory system, no excretory system. They have an innate Im immune um, system that resembles to the one of the higher organisms. Their immune response uh, consists in the production of very little protein, peptide, that can be active against viruses, fungi, cancer, uh, and we, we really don't know a lot about the interaction between nematodes and microorganisms in marine environment, environment, and even less in marine extreme environment that are oases of microbial life. What we know is the nematodes can survive even better, can proliferate in extreme conditions where usually the majority of marine life can die. So for this reason, we, I, launched, we, uh, I launched two projects, the DIVA, the Pioneer Project. They both aim to understand this interaction with the final goal, uh, the production <coughs> of antibiotic. And we discover for the moment two new species of nematode from the deep sea hydrothermal vent of Lucky Strike in the mid-Atlantic reach. And one of these species is very abundant in the most active site and is characterized by the presence of bacteria we can see inside the body and also Outside, this is the head of the nematodes, this is the tail. And if you look here, are full of bacteria inside the mouth. And you can see all the change of the pattern are really, it is completely covered by bacteria. So we want to try to, to study this, I can say, abyssal friendship between bacteria and nematodes to find new 
antimicrobial peptides. And we will test the activity of these antimicrobial peptides against cancer, against viruses, against fungi, a step towards a generation of new drugs. So now we know that we have a lot of species to discover. They can be potentially very useful for us. What are we humans doing to the deep sea? Honestly, a big mess. We always consider, we, we, we often consider deep sea something pristine, uh, untouched by humans, but this is not the case. The main anthropogenic impact was uh, the dump of litter in the ocean. These activities were banned in 1972, but the consequences are still there. And there is still the illegal activity. Uh, this is still uh, unfortunately present. When you dump litter in the water, will ultimately sink. When the litter arrives in the deep sea, he has nowhere else to go. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite easy. And there are new kind of pollution that uh, we, we are observing, like microplastic pollution. Uh, there are the first study reporting microplastic in the deep sea. And we have a project at Ifremer where we have a working patch, a package dedicated to the microplastic. We want to try uh, to, to really have a worldwide coverage to see where microplastic are in the deep sea. Their impact with the microorganism, mayofauna, because these little pieces can be ingested by fauna with a consequence that we don't know of today. And another thing, uh, the deep sea started to be our they are increasingly interesting because they are rich. Uh, energy resources, gas, oil, mineral resources, and biological resources, biotechnology, as we said before, and uh, deep sea fishing. And if we start to know the consequence of an oil spill in the deep sea, like the deep water horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, if we start to know the damage of the deep sea fishing, we still don't know what will be, what will be, be happen with the deep sea mineral extraction. This extractive activity will target massive sulfide associated with hydrothermal vents, as we said before, the oasis of life, ferromanganese crust associated with sea mount. There are other hotspots of abyssal life and polymetallic nodules associated with abyssal plane. And if we discover a new species, can be discovered new molecules, one day useful for men, our animals, especially the little one, are really endangered because the regulation of the exploitation by humans is really, really limited today. I hope that this dive in my microscopic wo world has opened your eyes to the chance we have, uh, to the potential of exploration is waiting us. After discovery of land, new animals, the man of 20th century turned his eyes to the sky to discover new planet, new star, new form of life. But do we know everything of our planet? I don't think so. What's happening in the big blue? We don't know. What's happening in the infinitely small? We don't know. Good news, the deep oceans are the last frontier of our planet, and we need new explorer to understand and protect one of the key that will maybe one day save us. And let's go back last time to Alice uh, when she tried to pass the door which opens in the very beautiful garden, and she was always too big or too small and she succeeded to pass this door floating in a sea of her tears. We have not to wait to cry of our mistake. We still have this key, it's very little key for a very little door, but which opens in a beautiful world, or maybe not. <laughs> a world plenty of secrets, secrets that will maybe save us one day. What is essential is invisible to the eye, is only with the heart, I would say with a good microscope, that one can see rightly. So please open your eyes. Thank you. <laughs>